Have you either own or have looked through a Teleview Ethos eyepiece? Anybody remember what the apparent field of view is in that? 100 degrees. That means you can look in that eyepiece and see all the way around to your empty wallet on the, in the back pocket <laughs> that it took to, to buy that eyepiece. Yeah. Somebody made that joke to uh, Al, Al Nagler at Teleview and he apparently didn't think it was too funny. But <laughs> <laughs> that, that came from Kathy, by the way, but before she left. Lighten up. <laughs> yeah, that was, I thought that was a hilarious thing. Yeah, they, but that's, they're pretty cool because on that one, you've got to get right down there and you can kind of look this way and look this way in the eyepiece and it's just got this really amazing apparent field of view. So John, thank you very much for, for doing that. All right. It's time for our um, official presentation tonight and um, our vice president is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Just some guy, you know, talking about the eclipse coming up. Don't really know him that well, but no, it's actually going to be our president, Ron Rannick, is going to speak, and I'm going to just read a little bit about what he's going to talk about tonight. So whether you're an Eclipse veteran or a beginner, you'll pick up some useful tips from tonight's presentation by the Denver Astronomical Society's Ron Rannick, with help from Soren, on how to observe August total eclipse with an emphasis on the experience of the event. Ron, who is our president, is an experienced solar and solar eclipse observer with many partial and two to total solar eclipses under his belt. He's a technical leader for Cisco Systems and is an, in addition to being an avid astronomical observer, he's also a collector of and a lecturer on meteor meteorites. If everyone's been over to Chamberlain's and seen his presentations, they're phenomenal. His engaging monthly talks on meteoroids, meteorite, me meteorites, meteors are staples of the Das Public Nights at DU's historic Chamberlain Observatory. He is also an experienced weather watcher for Denver's Channel 4. So without further ado, Barbara. Thank you. Is there anyone in this room who did not know that there's a total solar eclipse <laughs> next month? No, don't be shy. Um, I've asked this question in other groups where I've done a similar presentation, and there, there's usually a couple of folks in the audience who weren't aware of it or didn't know too much about it. So tonight I want to talk to you, uh, with some assistance from Soren, about how to observe this solar eclipse that's coming up. And as we think about this, of course we realize it's on a Monday, when some people will be in school, some people will be at work, um, but those of us who are hardcore fanatics about seeing these sorts of things, um, we're probably planning to take the day off or take some vacation time to do so. So what is it? It's a total solar eclipse. We've had partials visible here in Denver uh, in recent years. Uh, there was an annular solar eclipse visible in uh, New Mexico, although here it showed up as just a partial. The when? Monday, August 21st, 2017, so just a few weeks from now. Have you made arrangements for those of you going to see it? Yes. Has anybody not made arrangements and think you're going to call up a hotel in Casper and get a room? <laughs> okay. This is a pretty cool solar eclipse. It will be visible from Oregon to South Carolina. That's the totality part. This is the first time in 99 years that a total solar eclipse has gone from one coast to the other. The last time we had a total solar eclipse in the continental United States in the lower 48 was in February of 1979 and that one um, had a path of totality that, that went through part of Oregon, Washington State, northern Idaho, Montana, a little bit of North Dakota and into Canada. How many folks got to see that one? That was my first one. That was, a, that was pretty cool. There was another total solar eclipse visible in Hawaii in 1991. I think it was 1991. Occasionally you'll, you'll hear the media talk about this is the first total solar eclipse in the U.S. Well, no, 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 it's not. The first one in, in a, a long, long, long time, you know, a century or, or whatever. They forget to clarify it and they forget that Hawaii is part of the United States, I think. So this one is pretty cool. But the first thing I want to talk about right after I turn off this light here is safety. Safety is such an important part of observing the sun. I know that a lot of you have helped out at, at um, 
the Denver Museum of Nature and Science with some of the space days and other things that we've done there with solar observing and you have a good idea of the safety required. When it comes to observing the sun, you can damage your eyes permanently in a blink of an eye because the, the retina of the eye does not have pain receptors and that damage can happen and it can be permanent. Here's one thing you don't want to do. Take your trusty telescope, take the dust cap off, point this at the sun and do this. That is not a good thing to do. What you need to do with any telescope or binoculars is have a safe solar filter. This is a glass solar filter that happens to screw nicely onto the, the front of this, like so. This also has a viewfinder on it that is made just for the sun. If you don't have a viewfinder that works for the sun, do not use your existing viewfinder. Same thing. You take the cap off and look through it at the sun, you will be minus one eye. Um, this is not a good thing. Um, if you, but if you don't have a viewfinder that works with the sun, the way you can do this is to point the, the telescope in the general direction of the sun and look at the shadow on the ground and tweak this for the smallest shadow of the telescope. And you will be pointed almost right at the sun. And then you can look in the eyepiece, assuming you've got your filter on here, and fine-tune the positioning of the telescope. If you're going to be using binoculars, it's the same thing, except that now you need two filters. Here are some binoculars with two of these mylar-like filters on the front. And of course, they can't see anything through here because these types of so solar filters reduce the light passing through them to one one-thousandth of one percent. And that makes it safe to look at the sun directly uh, without having to worry about it. Um, the other thing is these, eclipse glasses. Denver Astronomical Society has eclipse glasses. You can get them from Dina down here for $2 a pair donation to DAS. These are, are certified safe. They are made of a special mylar-like material that does the same thing the solar filter here does and the solar filters there do. That is, reduces the light passing through them to one one-thousandth of one percent. Um, I do need to emphasize a couple things when it comes to the safety piece of this. Don't try to use some of these tricks where you take stacks of negatives or, or an old CD or some CDs and, or things like that because you run the risk of maybe it'll work, but what you don't know is what the optical passband of that, that gadget is. It may block the visible light, but it may not safely block the infrared or ultraviolet light, which can still do significant damage to your eyes. So I want to emphasize the safety piece of this big, 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 big time. So there it is. You must use a safe solar eclipse filter. Anytime you're looking at the sun, including the partial phases of the eclipse, when the eclipse reaches totality, only then can you take these things off and look at the sun directly with the unaided eye. It is perfectly safe to do so because at that point the moon has blocked the sun's photosphere and what you get to see is the sun's corona, that outer wispy atmosphere that can extend many, many millions of miles away from the sun in, in some cases. Um, and that is a really, really cool thing to see. So as you're looking at this eclipse, You've got to have suitable protection in all of those cases. Um, now, why don't, why don't you uh, quickly, quickly point out that the partial phases of the unfamiliar books will know this is the partial, this is the total, here's where it's not okay, here's where it is. Okay, as you, and that's, that's a good suggestion, Zach, thanks. As you look at this, and I've got some photo, photographs later on um, that show the various phases of the eclipse, but as the moon starts to pass in front of the sun, it will slowly take a bigger chunk of that sun um, and block it from view, which is pretty nice. But you can't look at the sun then without protection. Even when the sun is as much as 99% blocked by the moon, it is still too dangerous to look at the sun naked eye because you can still burn the retinas. Um, one other type of filter that would work if you didn't have the eclipse glasses or anything else is number 14 welding glass. Don't try anything less than that because the, the um, effectiveness of its ability to block all those wavelengths of light, infrared, ultraviolet, and visible light is questionable. 
Number 14 welding glass is fine. You may have to order it at a welding supply shop, though, because it's questionable whether they'll have it in stock. Well, uh, I found out in 99, uh, when uh, my wife and I went to Black Sea, we went down and ordered a couple of number 14 welding glass. It only took like two days for them to get it in. There you and go. The price was reasonable. And that, there you go, and that's, that's good input. Thank, thanks much, Ivan. The one thing, that, you have to cover the objective of any magnification things you can't use those glasses on the back side oh, no. yeah and I was gonna I was gonna get to that um, there there are two points about filtering the light um, and using a telescope or binoculars in this particular case the filter is on the front of the scope and over here the filters are on the front of the binoculars in the vast majority of cases that's where the filter goes Many of you may recall the old department store scopes that came with the little solar filter that screwed onto the eyepiece, and I'm sure most of us have looked at the sun through those things. I know I did years ago. Those are dangerous because of the heat buildup, and those are notorious for cracking. And if those things crack while you're looking through them, you get a blast of, of, of magnified light coming through that telescope right into your eye, which is not good. Now, the other thing you cannot do, this is an important one, Let's say you don't have a solar filter and you say, well, this is fine. I went and saw Dina and I paid two bucks and got a pair of Eclipse glasses. I'll just do this. Um, what do you think is going to happen? Well, the first thing it's going to do is melt a hole through the Eclipse glasses. Then it will burn the eyeball and you'll have laser beams coming out the back of your head. <laughs> so do not put these on and expect, I guess I should have readjusted these things that you can look through a pair of unfiltered binoculars or through an unfiltered telescope because that magnified sunlight will go right through these, these eclipse glasses. These things are meant to be worn like sunglasses and look at the sun just like this. Naked eye, unassisted. It will also hey. probably damage your telescope. Good point. Any questions on that piece of it? Um, I just want to comment on the question. I've that some of the glasses say you should be looking sure for longer than three minutes. If you know anything about that, the question is: um, Is there a time limit on uh, through through which you can, or, or, or that applies to using these eclipse glasses? Not that I'm aware of. I've used eclipse glasses in the past to look at the sun for half an hour. Well, not continuously, but you know, and it did, but certainly the, I've not I'm not aware of anything that would cause that to to uh, have a time limit on it and the reason of course is, is that the the sun's energy is not magnified or focused or concentrated in one spot there it's still spread out over the the whole surface area of the filter so there shouldn't be any limitation on that one thing you may want to be aware of is that that um, there are a couple different types of solar film I think Bodder makes a couple different types one for visual and one for photographic use and you don't want to use the photographic use type filters for visual uh, the reason is you can you can damage your eyes with that because it lets more light through than is safe for uh, for the eye. Um, Soren, other comments, particularly on the yeah, cameras. Uh, about cameras specifically, actually, is you need the same kind of filter as you do on a telescope when you're uh, using a, a camera to photograph the eclipse. One other consideration there is a lot of the point and shoot cameras that a lot of us have that have a little viewfinder you might look through. That viewfinder isn't necessarily going through the same lens as the image sensor on the camera is. It's, it's maybe looking out a different lens on the front of the camera. So you need to make sure both of those are covered with solar filter material. Good input. Uh, David. Make sure you protect your filters because if they get scratches or pinholes in them, they can be dangerous as well. That's a good point. Um, one of the things we, we have, uh, I think, I think it says on the, the uh, eyeglasses and also the envelope the eyeglasses come in, it, if, they, if there are any pinholes or tears or anything in them, throw them away. Don't use, don't use the Eclipse glasses. Could I retrofit Eclipse glasses into a filter for my camera? Uh, the question is, could you take the Eclipse glasses and, and build a filter for, say, a camera? And the answer is yes. Uh, there, in fact, there are some articles in, in some of the astronomy magazines and whatnot about taking Eclipse glasses and cutting them up and, and making filters for binoculars. You, making some cardboard and you know using hot glue and whatnot, making but making some little cardboard holders to put them in, and making sure that you block all the 
areas that aren't filtered, and you, then you could use that safely in that, uh, in, for that kind of filter. So the answer is yes, you could. Yeah, but em emphasize that that goes on the front of the binoculars. Yes, it goes on the front. It goes on the front. That's a particularly good solution for like the little compact cameras or even your cell phone, right? Just put the lens over your cell phone camera. Uh, question in the back. Um, yeah, and I was going to say, so regarding the totality, being able to observe the sun with your naked eye, that is only true for the people that are actually in the path of totality. Those at the peak of the eclipse, if you're not in the path of totality, you will never be able to look at the sun with your naked eye. Right, because the sun, the, the eclipse will not reach totality there, and that's the case here in Denver. It's about 92%, so you can never look at the sun on August 21st, directly unaided here in Denver. Or any other day. Well, or any other day for that matter, yeah. But not that day either. Um, you were saying when it's in totality, you take off the glasses to, and look at it. With, uh, yes. Can you do the same thing with your camera camera items at that time also? Yes. Take the question is, can you, can you, since you can look at the sun naked eye during totality, can you do the same with your camera? Could you take the filters off? And in fact, that's what most people do. Um, they, they try to figure out a way um, to have the filter on a camera, say, take pictures of the partial phases, and then try to remove this without jiggling the focus or anything else on there, uh, so they can take pictures of the, of the uh, total eclipse um, without any filters, and then put it back on. Um, the filters are available still, yeah. but, the t but the time lag is getting longer. Right, so I know that uh, Rainbow Symphony and Thousand Oaks, which are two of the big providers, they're backlogged on orders right now by a week or two. So get your order in now, yeah. six weeks away. Might check you in too. Be, be careful yeah. about buying from uh, other providers, you know, Amazon has a whole bunch of stuff on there. Other sites have a whole bunch of solar filter material on there. Make sure you're buying a known good brand that is ISO or CE certified. Um, I saw hands up here. I just ordered uh, filters for my binoculars and my camera. From, I don't remember the name of the company, but it's in uh, this last issue of Astronomy Magazine. I think it's on the next to the last page. And it's kind of, they're kind of neat, they're relatively cheap, the mylar filter, and you fold them down, it has kind of a spring-like kind of attachment to the... Oh, I think that's the Botter uh, filter. Say it again. I think that's made by Botter, B-A-A-D-E-R. I think you're right. Yeah, I, I saw one of those on a scope um, somewhere here a while back, and it's a really clever design. Yeah, and I got it, you know, I think it was uh, um, five days. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know we got a lot of questions here. Johnny, because uh, I want to get into the uh, uh, meat of the material. Go ahead. In a, a ballpark figure on how long is it going to take between first contact and end contact? I've got that coming up. Other questions? Because I'm just in the safety part of it right now, and then we get into the fun part. <laughs> so what if, I know that if you're looking at the clear blue sky with the sun in your building, bearing down, it's not a good idea to look at it. But what if it's like if you're in a spot where it's real cloudy and as, as you can get closer to the totality of the way it's been crescent, is it ever safe to look at it? No, no. There's too much risk of that sun popping through a, a hole in the cloud and causing eye damage. It just takes an instant. So no, if, even if it's cloudy, don't try to look at the sun like that without eye protection. Um, and this eclipse will be, the sun will be quite high in the sky no matter where you are along that path of totality, or if you're not even in totality anywhere in the country. So you're not going to have the opportunity to look at it during like a sunrise or sunset period where it's filtered through a lot of atmosphere. You always need the eye protection. Yes. There, there it is right there. When the glasses are on and the only time you can take them off, and that's totality. David. I just wanted to comment. If, you have a, if you're planning on doing a lot of things, you've got a couple cameras and you're moving um, things on and off, be very cautious. You get it's so exciting that you forget to do things in order and sequence. And if you take your cover off your, or you don't put the cover on your camera at the right time, you can damage it. So just be 
be aware that if you try to do too many things at when the eclipse is over or starting, just be aware that it's going to be very difficult to do it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I have a sheet of our film that I bought for <coughs> putting filters on my binoculars, and I'm not going to be using all that. I've got about a square foot. Okay, there we go. So some cameras have both a viewfinder and then the little camera. The lens. Filter both up. The camera, one that, that the camera is actually seeing that it's photographing through uh, the video screen, I assume, with your naked eye. You, you need to, you need to, you need to filter both. The, the viewfinder part on the front, if it's separate and it's not an SLR and goes through the lens, and you need to filter the lens, both. But if you filter the lens, you can look at the camera screen, the video screen. Yeah, you'll see it. You'll see the, you'll see the filtered sun there. Yeah, but yeah. do at least, if you have another viewfinder on there that's going through a right. separate lens, at least tape that over or something. Yeah, yeah, because you, you can damage the camera. Okay, I've got one more question, then I want to get into the, uh, the meat of observing the eclipse. This is not so much a question as it is a precaution or a warning. I was making another filter for another scope that I thought about hooking my camera up to. It was older material. And I was looking at it, and just through the naked eye, it looked good. So I made the filter and I stuck it on one of my smaller scopes. And when I was just aligning the scope coming up to the sun, and I had my eyepiece out because I wanted to check the filter with a little more magnification on it. And that's when I saw a bunch of pinholes and scratches on it. So, Ooh, not good. You can black track. But I mean, we, if there was too many there for me. If there's too many, it may not be good. If, there's, if there aren't many, you can sometimes black those out or, or put a little, put something over them, block them. Oh yeah, you all, uh, and that goes for the eclipse glasses, everything. Always check it. it. The filter I've got is a glass filter. I check that first because if that got, you know, gets cracked or something, it goes in the trash can. Ivan, I've got to get into the, the rest of the presentation here. All right, we've talked about the safety. So let's talk now about what the heck is a solar eclipse? And Leo, could you uh, turn on the little the light over here on the gadget, please? Sorry, Soren. Soren, I'll be all right. Smack me upside the head. No, you just you just stay right there. You stay you stay you stay right there, Soren. I've got Leo doing this over here. A solar eclipse happens when the moon gets in the way of the sun's light, and then the moon's shadow is cast upon the Earth. And this photograph is from NASA. This is taken, I think, from the International Space Station during an eclipse. And there you can see the moon's umbral shadow on the surface of the Earth. As far as total solar eclipses, they happen somewhere on Earth on average about every year and a half. Somewhere on Earth, a partial solar eclipse occurs up to a couple times a year. There are some years when there aren't any, but these are good average numbers to keep in mind. Now if you look at Soren's little demo down here, you can see that he is simulating the sun with, with the light here. We've got the moon right here and the shadow of the moon being cast upon the globe that represents the earth. That's what's going on when a solar eclipse happens. Here's another um, graphic that illustrates kind of the geometry, obviously not to scale here, um, but you can see that interestingly there are two types of shadows. There's an umbra and a penumbra. And some people wonder, well, why on earth are there two different types of shadows with an eclipse like this. And, and the reason has to do with the fact that the sun is not a point source. If it were a point source, you'd just have the one shadow. But because it is not a point source, we get the umbral shadow, which is where you want to be if you want to see totality, and the penumbral shadow, which is what, where you're going to see a partial solar eclipse. So let's take a look at the anatomy of these things and the, the key parts that you need to keep in mind. Um, we're not going to be able to see the moon in the daytime because it is a new moon, so it's going to be a full moon on the other side facing away from us. So this moon is going to come up right to the edge of the limb of the sun and at that point we call it first contact. It's a little tough to tell exactly when first contact occurs if you're just looking at the sun through eclipse glasses. Now the odds are you'll probably have an app or or something else that tells you when it when first contact is for your location. 
Typically, if you want to see first contact and be one of those first ones to go, yay, first contact, um, this happens at total eclipses, trust me. Um, but it's usually from people looking through a telescope. Little hint, if you want to see first contact before others see it with their white light filters, look at the sun through a hydrogen alpha filter. Because at that point, you're seeing where the limb makes contact with the chromosphere, which is a little farther out from the photosphere. In the 06 eclipse in Libya, I was looking through my hydrogen alpha scope at the sun, and yes, indeed, saw first contact before other folks saw it with their white light filters and did the old, it's first contact. Um, and you'll hear that if you're with a group of experienced eclipse observers. Somebody's going to holler out first contact. So that's what's going on. It just, that moon just touches the limb of the sun and begins the partial phase. And the partial phases will last on the, the we'll call it the Gozinta part here, for an hour to an hour and a half. It depends on location in the country, but that moon is going to slowly creep across the face of the sun and take bigger and bigger bites out of the sun until we get what's called second contact. This is when totality begins. Third contact is when totality ends. Now for us in the United States for this eclipse in August, totality is two to two and a half minutes depending on your location. I think the maximum is around two minutes and 45, 43 seconds, something like that. And then uh, we have the the Gozauta partial phases, so kind of a repeat, but backwards from the Gozinta part of this, and this will last another hour to an hour and a half. And then fourth contact, here too, um, it's best to tell that that's going on with a telescope. That's when the partial phase ends. So that's the anatomy of this. And the things that we want to keep in mind are the times when these four pieces and parts occur. So let's take a closer look at this. If you want to see the total solar eclipse, you've got to be somewhere in this gray stripe right here going from Oregon to South Carolina. The average width of that gray stripe is 67 miles. If you think, well, I'll just go up here right to the edge of it, maybe you drive north to Wheatland, Wyoming. Totality there, 58 seconds. Drive to Casper or Glendo, you're at about two and a half minutes. So you want to get close to the center line um, as possible. Now this narrow strip, I said it averages about 67 miles wide, actually varies from about 62 to 71 miles in width. It depends on your location across the country. Um, the moon's shadow will zip from coast to coast in 94 minutes. That's it. It's going to be hustling. Here's a map of of uh, Wyoming, just north of us, and you can see the center line of the path of totality, which is ideally where you want to be, whether it's in Wyoming or Idaho or Oregon or somewhere else. You want to be somewhere on that blue line. Notice it goes right through Casper. Casper's going to be a zoo <laughs> on Monday the 21st. I fully expect there's going to be a lot of hype in the local media here in Denver on Saturday, Sunday, maybe Friday, you know, on the local newscast, in the newspaper, on the radio, and a lot of people are going to make a last minute decision that weekend to drive to Casper Monday morning. Alliance. Normally, it takes about four and a half hours to drive from the Denver area to Casper. Normal traffic on the interstate. I fully expect that Interstate 25 from Denver north is going to be a parking lot after probably about 6 a.m. If you're going to drive up Monday morning, my recommendation is that you leave no later than 3 a.m. or maybe 4 a.m. I would say 4 a.m. is the latest. If you leave at 6, parking lot. If you leave at 7, parking lot. I was corresponding with a member of, of uh, an astronomy club in Australia oh, a month or so ago. And he's coming up here as part of a tour group that's going to stay in a hotel downtown. They're going to do the usual sightseeing stuff as part of this whole thing. He told me that the, the bus that is taking them to see the eclipse is planning to leave downtown Denver at 7 a.m. <laughs> I suggested that he contact that travel company 
and rethink the time of departure to something like 4 a.m. Because I said, if you guys leave at 7 a.m., you will miss totality, guaranteed. So don't even think about it. So there, you want to be inside this stripe right here. Soren, anything to add to that? Uh, I think the only thing to add is there's actually a really great free app for iPhone and Android called Totality uh, by Big Kid Science. It's actually developed by Jeffrey Simons uh, <coughs> up in Boulder using the interactive eclipse map uh, from NASA. And it's a free download and it gives you a Google map that you, shows you the path of totality. You can zoom in to anywhere you want and click and it will give you the exact timings for first through fourth contact for that location. Can you give that link again? Totality. The app is called Totality. It's by Big Kid Science, Android and iPhone. Just go to the Apple App Store or the Android, wherever, I, I don't have an Android, but wherever, wherever you get apps for Android platforms, look for the Totality app. I did hear some speculation that Miami might run out of gas. Might run out of gas? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All right, so ready, set, and it's time for the eclipse. All right, well, the first thing you want to do, and I'd say do this in advance of observing the eclipse, you want to find, you know, figure out where you're going to go, maybe have a plan B in case the weather doesn't cooperate, but you want to figure out when those contact times are. There's the link to the NASA Interactive Map website. The app that Soren just mentioned um, was done by the same person that did the software for this. And it is a really cool web page. You zoom, you go to that link, you zoom in on the map, and you click on the spot that you want, and this nice box shows up with all this great information on it. And I'll show you what it looks like for Casper. Back up, back up, back up. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's taking pictures. I've got a, a, a PowerPoint slide at the end. It's got all these URLs on it. Got it? Okay, there's a close-up of the box that shows up. Now, the, what doesn't show up is this printing over here. I put that on the, on the screen. But what I did was zoom in on the map on my computer, clicked on Casper, and this box showed up. So it says, first contact right there, 1622 UTC. Well, that works out to 1022 in the morning. Um, second contact, 1142. Maximum eclipse, 1143 and change. Third contact. 11.45, you can see it's about two and a half minutes, and fourth contact, 1.09 p.m. End to end, about three hours. My recommendation is stick it out for the whole three hours. It's definitely worth it to watch first through fourth contacts on these things. I know a lot of people will say, all right, the, the totality's ended, I'm going to pack up and go home. And some do, that's fine, but frankly, you're, you're wherever you're going to be, enjoy the whole thing. It's, it's three hours of a lot of fun. So on Eclipse Day, you want Eclipse glasses or other suitable safe solar filters. Remember, we, we have Eclipse glasses over here for two bucks, a pair donation to DAS, complete with all the legal warnings and how to use them stuff on the envelope. Apply sunscreen. You're going to be out in the sun, hopefully it's not cloudy. You're going to be out in the sun for at least three hours, probably more, because you're more than likely going to go out, set up your scopes, put your filters on, get everything checked out. Um, lots of sunscreen, wide-brimmed hat, sunglasses. The sunglasses are not to look at the sun. That's just to kind of keep your eyes shaded for the routine stuff you're doing. But sunscreen's a big deal. Do you have water? Make sure you've got drinking water with you. So have some bottled water handy, or you know, a cooler full of apple juice or whatever. Find a comfortable place to enjoy this experience. Um, set out a lawn chair, and I'd say sit back and relax, but there's a little bit more that you're gonna do. Now here's an interesting one. I'll talk about this a little bit more later on. Put a large white poster board or an old white sheet or a towel on the ground. Weight it down so it doesn't blow away in the wind. We'll come back to that in a little bit. A few minutes before first contact, look around. Look at the shadows, look at the horizon all around you, listen. Do you hear bugs chirping, birds chirping? Do you, do, just listen for the, the, the noises of nature. 
take a look at the shadows underneath trees and you'll see that they're, you know, they're the usual splotches of, of light and dark. But just kind of get a kind of get an idea of what's going on around you. If you're, if you're going to have fun and measure the temperature, take the temperature. See what it's like. Now look at the sun with your eclipse glasses or your filtered scope or binoculars. See what's going on. Maybe you can see some sunspots on it. That might be kind of fun. Uh, I know there's a sunspot group that just came around the limb uh, and is visible right now. Let's cross our fingers and hope that we get a sunspot or two on eclipse day. Um, what you're going to see, and this surprises a lot of people, you put your eclipse glasses on and you look at the sun. If you've never done this before, you're going to be surprised. Say, wow, the sun is really small. It looks about the same size as the full moon. This is normal. There's a reason that we have an eclipse. Because the full moon is about the same size as the sun from our perspective. And it's going to go in front of that sun. And if the moon from our perspective happens to be a little bit bigger than the sun, and it blots it out, and we see this nice total solar eclipse. So just take a look at things. See what's going on. All right, first contact, I talked about this. You're going to want to look for that little nubbin of the edge of the sun being eaten up by the moon. And over the next hour to 90 minutes or so, the moon is going to slowly take bigger and bigger and bigger bites out of the sun. At no point in any of these partial phases is it safe to look at the sun without proper filters. Even here, will cause eye damage. It doesn't look like it, but it will. Now here's something to keep an eye on. As the partial phase progresses, look at the shadows around you. Look at the contrast of the shadows. Look at the ambient light in the sky. You probably won't notice much difference, if any, in the ambient light till the sun is more than about 80 or 90 percent eclipsed. But one of the things that I want you to do is while this is in the partial phases, go back and look at those shady spots under trees and bushes. Remember where there were just some random splotches of light coming through the leaves? Now you're going to see these. All those little holes between the leaves have become pinhole projectors and what you see on the ground underneath are all these little crescents of the sun which are really, really cool. Take a peek through your solar telescope from time to time in the partial phases. See if you can see on the leading edge of the moon here any mountains. Now I've, I've seen that in hydrogen alpha. Um, you may need to bump up the magnification in white light, but take a look and see if you can see the, the, the mountains and craters on the limb of the moon right there as it's eating into the sun and covering this up. Now here's something that's going to that'll catch your attention. As you get up, as we get up into kind of this range of the partial phases, the ambient light is going to get, is going to take on an eerie appearance. I mean, that is the best way to describe it. It takes on an eerie appearance. It, the light just seems weird. The other thing is, the shadows have more contrast. You look at your own shadow on the ground or the, shadow, the shadows from, you know, signs or posts or whatever, they're a lot sharper. Now while we're in this um, first contact thing here, I wanted to run this video and for whatever reason it's running really slow on my computer, but I'll just punch this up just for a minute here and let this, whoops, get that back up there. Come on, where do we go here? There we go. This is an animation from um, NASA's website that shows the, uh, the shadow going across the country. Uh, the speed of that shadow varies depending on your location. As the shadow approaches the coast of Oregon, it's going to be moving at about 2,900 miles an hour, give or take. Um, central Nebraska in the 1,700, 1,800 mile an hour range. So if you're up in Nebraska, Wyoming, figure somewhere in that 1,800 mile an hour range is how fast that shadow is moving. By Western Kentucky, you're in the 1,400 mile an hour uh, range, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, figure about 1,500 miles an hour. Uh, remember, that shadow is moving across the country in just 94 minutes. This, this animation actually shows this thing going all the way across the U.S., but I'm not going to go through all that. 
It has to do with your observing altitude? Um, the speed of it has to do with the geometry of the shadow and the angle to the sun and the moon relative to where you are in the country. Because if you, it, the, the moon is, is not changing speed in its orbit around the earth. So you'd think, well, wait a minute, why, why, doesn't, that, why doesn't that shadow move the same speed across the country? And it doesn't because when that shadow hits the west coast of the United States, it's coming in at a pretty steep angle like this. Which, and the graphic that showed the kind of that oval shape is actually correct. The, the uh, shadow of the moon will not be a circle at that point. It'd be kind of an oval. So you've got the, the geometry of the angle there that, that gives that increased speed, it's relative it's speed. It's angular momentum stays the same across the curved surface. Yeah, yeah. We've got a, yeah, it's going across the curved surface, and plus you've got this thing coming in at an angle like this. Yeah, it's but the in 94 minutes coast to coast, it's it's hustling. All right. Now earlier I mentioned that you should set out a poster board or a white towel or an old white sheet on the ground and weight it down with rocks. The reason you do that is just before totality begins and just after it ends, you may see a phenomenon called shadow bands. These don't always show up, and a number of very experienced eclipse veterans have never seen them. The first time I saw them was in 2006, and it was actually my wife who saw them at the end of totality and the eclipse, and we saw it on the, the dry, um, the, the real light-colored desert surface where we were observing the eclipse. And it is cool. Only lasts a few seconds. It's an atmospheric phenomenon. Um, that is the result of the fact that the sun is not a point source, but is this really thin crescent with a real, real uh, out of whack um, height to, to width aspect ratio. And if there's some turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, you'll see these ripples that are called shadow bands. And it resembles the shadows of ripples you see on the bottom of a swimming pool. It doesn't last very long. You might see it on the side of a building or something else. But put these, these, these uh, you know, white towel or white poster board on the ground. And then and what you want to want to start looking for the shadow bands a couple minutes before um, totality begins. But they're kind of fun to see. And the first contact, you're going to get to the point now where we see these things called Bailey's beads. Um, they're named after, and there's no E in there. That is spelled correctly, in case you're curious. Named after the person who came up with the correct explanation of why they occur. But as that moon almost blots out the sun, a little bit of light from the photosphere is making its way through some of the valleys and, and other things along the limb of the edge of the moon right there. And so what we get is this phenomenon called Bailey's beads. Now this picture is a little overexposed right here, so you can't see it. But, but what it was actually doing was little splotches of light across here. You can also see right here a little bit of the chromosphere. This is without a hydrogen alpha filter. As the uh, moon continues to move across, it gets down to the point where that sunlight is coming through maybe one or two little valleys on the, on the limb of the moon, and it produces what's called the diamond ring effect. These are cool things to see. Um, at this point, you should still have your protection on, uh, but as that, as that uh, diamond ring pops up there and it just starts to fade out, take the eclipse glasses off. With, when it's Bailey's beads around here, that's still really too bright to look at safely because you could still potentially inter injure your eyes. Yeah. All right, you reach totality, pull off the eclipse glasses and enjoy the view. You've got about two and a half minutes during which you can safely look at the sun without any eye protection. Question? Um, Dave Tondra told me about something that I never thought about before, but if you think about how long it takes your eyes to dark adapt, they're just going to be about dark adapted when the eclipse ends. So he told me to buy an eye patch and put it over one eye. And then if yeah. you take it off just as totality starts, one of your eyes is already dark adapted, and you can see a lot of the stars and the, and the um, chromosphere, if I have the right word. Uh, corona. A lot, corona, a lot more readily. Yeah, and that's a good point. So here's the time you can look at the sun safely. It's during this roughly two and a half minute time frame. All right. The old saying is, every total solar eclipse lasts eight seconds. <laughs> and it sure seems like it. How many of you in here have seen a total solar eclipse before? 
How long did it last? Eight seconds, right? Or at least it felt like it. Um, you know, whether it's a four minute eclipse or a two minute eclipse or a seven minute eclipse, that time goes by like that. It, everyone seems like eight seconds. There's just not enough time to enjoy everything that's there. And I note that here. You don't have much time, but here's some other things to keep in mind. Don't make a checklist and then say, well, okay, I want to, Ron said to look at this and this and this and this. And this. Oh, wait a minute. Totality ended, darn it. Just keep these things in mind. First thing, it's going to be like twilight came out of nowhere. Despite what you might see in the popular media, it ain't going to get pitch black. It's going to be like deep twilight. You may see a few brighter stars and some brighter planets. You're not going to see the Milky Way. The sky is not going to light up with stars. Um, this is from uh, the Sky Safari Pro app for an iPhone. And I just popped the screen up here for Casper on the day of the eclipse so you can get an idea of some of the things that may be visible. More than likely, what you will be able to see would be, besides the eclipse sun, of course, would be Venus, probably Jupiter, but pretty down low on the horizon, um, Sirius, potentially Regulus, which doesn't show up here until you zoom in, because Regulus is only going to be about a degree from the sun. So you may be able to see that star. Um, beyond that, maybe Arcturus, but um, it all depends on what the sky conditions are doing. So this is where the suggestion from Dave Tondro that Dina just shared about maybe having an eye patch on a few minutes before totality to get one eye dark adapted will help you see some of these things a little, little bit better. Yeah, um, yeah, Mars is, yeah, Mars is right up. Yeah, I've got Mars right in here too. So you may be able to see that as well. Um, so this is, this, these are some of the things just to kind of keep an eye out for while we're in the total phase. And I saw Venus before totality, so Venus is pretty bright, so you're getting down to one... Some people are going to be looking for Venus before totality, which is fine. That's kind of a fun thing to do. It should be easy to find, and will be fairly bright. As with anything, it's daytime sky, so as you're looking up in that sky for Venus, do so safely, because you don't want to be looking at the sun and arc weld your eyelids shut. Okay. There's something else to look for. You'll notice the temperature has dropped. It may drop as much as about 10 degrees or so. If you're in an area where the birds were chirping, and it depends on the time of the day, but if you heard birds chirping before, and this is why I suggested earlier just to kind of listen to things and look at things, birds will stop chirping. <coughs> street lights might come on. The 79 eclipse, I noticed that. The street lights came on, and the birds stopped chirping. The other thing you want to do, if, depending on where you're seeing this from, look at the horizon all around you for what's called the 360 degree sunset effect. Because if you've got a good view of the full horizon or even part of it, you'll see what looks like a 360 degree sunset all the way around the horizon. By the way, one thing I forgot to mention on the previous slide is as you're getting real close to the beginning of totality, look toward the west. And you'll notice that most of the horizon is still normal, but Toward the west, it's dark. That is the moon's shadow racing toward you at that 14, 15, 1600, 1800 mile an hour speed. So look, look and see if you can see the 360 degree sunset effect. Don't forget to look up at the eclipse and enjoy it. A lot of people spend so much time putting around with cameras and other things, they forget to look at the eclipse and, and actually enjoy totality. Look around the limb of the sun. Maybe you'll see some prominences sticking out. Um, that's normally, normally we can't see those unless we're looking through a hydrogen alpha telescope. Look at the shape and the size of the corona. How many radii does it extend from, um, from the sun? The other thing to look for while you're doing this is look at the structure of the corona. The structure of the corona, that is its shape, depends on the timing in the 11 year solar cycle. If it's a solar minimum like we are now, you're likely going to notice that it's got a much different shape than eclipses that you've seen in photographs taken during peak solar activity. So take a look at the shape of the thing. This is a fun one. If you're in a group, look at the reactions of people around you. I have seen people scream, cry. Um, when we were in Libya for the 06 eclipse, there were a group of men that were biased, uh, enjoying the views of the partial phases through our scopes. When totality hit, they were on the ground praying. And they prayed for four solid minutes. It's a cultural thing. 
for the return of the sun. I mean, to see stuff like that is pretty amazing. Now they missed a really good, they, it worked, they missed a really good total eclipse. But look around for the reaction of people around you. Notice your own reaction. A total solar eclipse is one of Mother Nature's most spectacular phenomena and it can drag emotions out of people that they didn't know they had. It's a, there's something I think that goes into just, you know, way, 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 way deep parts of our brain that just, we have this reaction to the, to the day turning to almost night in, you know, almost instantly. But I guarantee you, you will see in other people and possibly yourself some really interesting reactions to this. All right, third contact, totality ends, you get the diamond ring effect, get those eclipse glasses back on, then we have Bailey's beads. Um, enjoy the partial phase for the next hour to an hour and a half. Look at that white poster board right after totality ends, or that towel or sheet on the ground, see if you can see any shadow bands. They don't last long, couple seconds maybe at most. Um, look toward the east, depending on your location, you may see the moon's shadow zipping away from you. When we were in Libya for the 06 eclipse, and it, nobody expected this, I mean we were fortunate it was extremely flat, light colored, um, hard surface we saw the moon's shadow racing away from us and it was just, oh, holy cow. So depending on where you are, you may be able to see it and it, that's one, that will take your breath away when you see that, if you see it. Um, keep an eye on the ambient brightness. You'll notice the you know, temperature starts to come back up. The, uh, the brightness gets better. That eerie light will be there for a bit and then it gets more normal. Birds start chirping again. The street lights will, will go off and um, you know, while you're doing this, take a peek through the, through the eyepiece of your scopes and see if you can see those mountains on the, uh, um, the edge of the moon as it's going away from covering up the sun. So while this moon is slipping away, enjoy the view. Don't just pack up and say, okay, we're done. We saw totality, we're done. Enjoy the rest of it. Enjoy that next 90 minutes. Have fun with this. And then use your scope to try to determine that, that point where the sun just makes that last little bit right there, and then it's over. Does anybody ever give off the last contact? <laughs> <laughs> they can, they can. Um, there's a list of resources. I would strongly encourage you to do something fun with kids. Um, I took a mailing tube that I got at, I think, the FedEx store, and I made a solar projector out of it. So one end of it, I took the plastic out, cut a little square hole in it, taped some tin foil on it, took a straight pin, popped a hole in it. The other end, I took the, uh, the plastic out, just put a piece of paper plate on there to act like a projection screen, cut a hole, a viewing hole in here, and then all you do, and this is safe for kids because you don't have to look at the sun, and you line it up like this by just getting a minimum shadow on the ground and then you'll see um, the sun, a projected image of the sun. And do the, you can do this in the full phase, you know, the un, uneclipsed phases, but certainly it's fun during the partial phases. You'll see a little projected image of the sun on the inside here. And if you don't have any mailing tubes, get a couple pieces of cardboard. Put some poster paper on here, take the other one, just cut a square hole in it, put some tin foil over it, put a, uh, poke a, poke a pinhole in it, and then just do this. Just, this guy can be you know, leaned up against the wall somewhere, and then do the same thing, kind of move this around, and you'll project an image on here. That's all you got to do. Pinhole will give you the sharpest image. If you poke a bigger hole, you'll get a bigger projected image here, but it'll be a, not quite as crisp and clear as it is with the smaller pin, which is why pinhole cameras um, do what they do. Soren, anything to add for activities and fun things for the kids and families? Um, just always bring activities for the kids to do, whether that's coloring books or something else to keep them on the um, The other suggestion is bring an umbrella uh, not because of rain, but for shade, because it's going to be August 21st, and we've already had a sense of that kind of summer heat over this past couple of weeks here, and you're going to be standing out in that for about three or four hours. So you're going to want some shade at times, uh, and you're probably not going to be setting up under a tree. <laughs> 
Uh, good references out there, and I'll show, show some of these. Um, you can still order these online. This one is um, made like those DeLorme road atlases that we've probably all had in our cars at one time or another and gone on vacations. But this one has got maps that show the eclipse path all across the United States in nice detail. And, and times, that's a good point. The, uh, this is kind of a companion book. You don't have to get it, but it's, it's a good book, and it's got all kinds of good stuff in it on uh, predicted weather. Well, actually, climate would be a better description along the eclipse path. It's got some maps. It's got information on filters and, and um, a whole bunch of other good things. I'll plug um, Soren's great book here. This has got um, a description of, of uh, how to observe the eclipse. I'm kind of biased on that particular article because I wrote it for him. But, um, <laughs> But he's got a lot of good stuff in, in here on getting ready for the eclipse, things to, to pack. Um, there are activities in here. There are maps in here. He's got some things for the kids to, to do and to color. Dad had a list of Dairy Queens along the way. A list of Dairy Queens along the way? You have those here tonight, right? I do have these here tonight. Um, and the book is $20 for four pairs of eclipse glasses. So there you go. And then, of course, DAS also has eclipse glasses. Questions? Uh, could, I, could I make a point here? Yes, sir. Please, everybody, if you take a camera, turn the flash off. <laughs> <laughs> Put tape over it, whatever it takes, because when you go into totality, all these flashes going off. <laughs> Speaking of photography, um, and I have read this in numerous articles by people who have been to a lot of total eclipses. They say if this is your first total eclipse, don't try to photograph totality. Their suggestion is take pictures of the people around you, what people are doing, the reactions of the people, and enjoy the eclipse. What's going to happen is if you've never done this kind of photography before, you're going to be fiddling with your camera, trying to get it focused, and trying to s take different pictures at different exposure settings, and the eclipse is going to be over in that eight seconds, and you will not have looked up to enjoy it. So the, the advice is let the professionals who have a lot ex of experience taking pictures during totality, let them take the pictures, grab them off the internet or buy them. So the people will be selling posters and stuff and enjoy the eclipse. I remember reading uh, about some professional had been to over a dozen eclipses. Had never seen one because he was always operating his equipment. <laughs> That's too easy to do. It, it really is too easy to do. Yeah, and this one's only a couple minutes long, so there's not much time. My advice is if you've never seen an eclipse before, just go enjoy it. Don't worry about trying to do things fancy with equipment. Eclipse glasses will be fine. If you've got a telescope with a solar filter, enjoy the partial phases. Take the filters off, the glasses off during totality. Enjoy it. Maybe snap a picture of the people around you, listen to the reactions, uh, set up a camcorder or something and shoot a video of the people and get some of the reactions of people screaming or crying or whatever they're doing. Uh, you'll have a lot, a lot more fun. Question or comment up here? Uh, I comment two questions. Comment is I like to see a show of hands and how many people are going to try to make it up to the solar eclipse. What's that? How many people are going to go see totality? Can we get to ride with you? The first question is solar eclipse is going to cover a whole lot more ground of I 20 cover a whole lot more ground of I-80 than I-25. Is I-80 in the part not too? Um, the path of totality, let's see, I-80 through, say, southern Wyoming is not in totality. Uh, I-80 in Nebraska. Yeah. yeah. Uh, looking through Wyoming, it's, it's pretty far north. Even... Yeah, you'd have to be, the, the, um, the center line parallels Interstate 25 in Wyoming um, where 
I-25 jogs from north and goes west over go, at, at Glendo and goes over to Casper, so by Douglas and Glenrock. It pretty much parallels that. That's a good place to be. However, and this is a general comment for anywhere you go, I'm guessing that local sheriffs and police and state patrol are going to take a dim view of people just pulling off the side of the road to look at the eclipse. I know people are going to do it and the police are going to be overwhelmed, but don't be one of those unlucky few that gets told, get off the road, it's unsafe to be parking here. The gentleman who called the observatory and left a message, and you told me about it at the last meeting, you told everybody and I jumped on it, is a deputy sheriff. so. I may have a lights and siren escort to totality. <laughs> Yay. You said you had another another question? Oh, yeah, but uh, I-80, you see the map on I-80 and Nebraska, it's a whole lot more around I-80 and Nebraska than I-25 in Wyoming. Oh, that's true. Yeah, okay. So that's part of my problem. Uh, don't try to park along the side of the interstate. You'll probably get in trouble by the... the, the you'll, No. First, first in the continental U.S. since 79. I mean, coast to coast. Coast to coast, 99 years. That's right. Oh, okay. Why isn't there more? more. The, <laughs> it has to do with, with uh, geometry. Um, and, and, I, and I'm oversimplifying this a bit because the only times that a, a, a total solar eclipse can occur is when there's a specific alignment of the moon with the sun. Now you might think, well wait a minute, okay, it happens during new moon, why don't we get a total solar eclipse at every new moon? And the reason is the orbital plane of the moon's orbit around the earth is inclined about five degrees um, relative to the ecliptic. That is, think of our equator. So the only time we can get a total eclipse is, w at w is when the moon is located at what are called the nodes. So if you can visualize this magazine as being equal to the, the Earth's equator, kind of like this guy right here, um, yeah, this might be even better. So visualize this is the Earth. However, the orbit of the moon doesn't go around evenly like this. It's inclined five degrees. Now, I'm exaggerating here, but it's inclined about five degrees. The only time that an eclipse can occur is at the nodes in that orbital inclination, which happens to be where this inclined orbit of the moon matches the equator of the Earth, if you will, or the ecliptic in the sky. And that's at two different points, on this side and on this side. And if these are here on this side and the sun's back here, you're not going to get an eclipse when the moon's out here, because the moon's either going to be five degrees high or five degrees low. So these nodes have got to be lined up where the moon is between the sun and the earth. And in the complication, those nodes turn. That's it. The nodes do kind of this thing, moving around. And what that means is then that, and then of course the earth turns, so we're not going to get a total solar eclipse every month at new moon and all this stuff's got to line up just right. In order for their, the, the way the math works out, and it's all statistics because it can actually be a lot longer or a lot shorter, um, for a total solar eclipse to reoccur at the same geographic location again, on average about every 300 years. Next total solar eclipse after this year's is 2024, visible in Texas and parts of southeast and up into the northeast of the US. Um, but on average, uh, every 18 months somewhere on the earth there's a total solar eclipse. But oftentimes it's out in the middle of nowhere. It's, you know, <laughs> up here, up here at the North Pole or out here in the middle of the ocean or down here in South America or over in Africa or someplace else. Uh, remember the last total solar eclipse in the continental US was, was 38 years ago, back in 1979. Denver. 39 years. There, there you go. Jack. So I was wondering if uh, you plan to post that on our listserv. Can I post this on our listserv? Somewhere where we can remember to get at it. It's a, oh, you mean just all the web links? Yeah. yeah, I think I could do that. Send it as an email. Send it as an email. Take a picture of it. Oh, an email? That'd be really good. Yeah, I could send this as an email with, uh, with the. Uh, 
this, all these URLs? Yeah, I'll leave the slide up for a few minutes. Any other questions? Just a minute. The, you can use a timer if you want, but most people are not going to mess with a timer. What they're going to, what they will see, is as the moon is is um, move, starting to move away from completely covering the sun, diamond ring appears again. When you see that diamond ring, I mean, you can you can safely look at that briefly like that, and it won't hurt your eyes. But you see that diamond ring, get the glasses on. That's your timer. Yeah, if you're going to ignore the seven second advice and try and do multiple operations in practice, yeah. set a kitchen timer for two minutes and try and do all the things that you think you have to do. Those are good points. John says to practice, and there's um, um, Alan Dyer wrote a, a good ebook that's available for, I don't know, 10 bucks online on how to photograph the eclipse. And he's got a lot of good advice in it. And one of the bits of advice he has is practice. Practice taking pictures of the sun with your filters and stuff in the daytime. Practice taking pictures of the full moon at night. You want to get to where you can do this stuff just kind of second nature. Because I guarantee you when the eclipse happens, you're going to be overwhelmed with emotion. And you're going to be trying to pull your hair out trying to do all these different things. Which is why I say maybe it's best not to bother with all that stuff. Just enjoy the eclipse. You can. Um, what I'm going to do uh, is, is set up scopes at a friend's house, an old classmate's house up in Casper. I'm going to leave the white light filters on the scopes. And I'll have one hydrogen alpha scope set up. So I'm going to leave that, that alone. Um, some sources say that during totality, if you want to get a better view, up close view of the corona and the details in the corona, you could look through binoculars unfiltered. I will say that if you're going to do that, be careful. Um, that two and a half minutes is going to go by like that. And you do not want to be looking at the sun through binoculars without filters um, when totality ends. So if you're going to look at the corona through binoculars, it is safe to do so during totality. I would recommend doing it right after totality begins. Look for a few seconds and go, you know, the ooh and the ah, put them down. And then enjoy it naked eye. Because you absolutely do not want to risk looking at the sun as totality ends. That's, that, that focused and concentrated light will, will cause major damage. could damage your binoculars and damage your eyes big time. I'm sorry, what was the e-book again? Name? The e-book, Alan Dyer, who's, uh, who has been writing in, in the astronomy magazines for decades, I think. Uh, I can't remember the... How did, how did the photograph totally... Yeah, there you go. I download. I bought it. It's ten bucks. I downloaded it uh, for my iPad, and and I have it on my iPhone. Although it's easier to read on the iPad, it is really well done. It's a very very well done book, and easily worth ten bucks. And he goes through everything on that you need to know on how to photograph the eclipse. John. Yeah. Besides people and birds, if there's an animal around, particularly a dog, watch it. It'll tramp down the grass start to lie down, oh, wait a minute, and get up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, it is fun to watch the reactions of not only the people, but nature. And you know, the listen, the, the sights, the sounds. Um, you're going to be amazed at the things you see in this. And I'm glad to see that so many people in here are planning to go see Totality. We've received a number of requests um, to our external outreach email address. Can you come to our school and help us observe the partial phases here in Denver? And the answer that, that um, I, I started to answer them at first, but Julie, I think, has probably got the stock answer down now. Um, pretty much all of our members are going to be traveling out of state to see totality on August 21st. There's not going to be anybody here. We're not doing anything at Chamberlain that day. There won't be anybody here to do it. Um, yes, I know the Museum of Nature and Science is doing stuff at the museum and other people will be doing things, but from what I understand, the vast majority of our members are heading out of state to see totality. I mean, if it's, if it's, well, the other thing is, if, if it's that close, as good as the partial eclipse is going to be here in Denver, 
it, the difference between a partial eclipse and a total solar eclipse yeah. is like the difference between night and day. It's like the difference between looking at a picture of the Grand Canyon and seeing it in person the first time. Yeah. There is no comparison. And I guarantee you, if you've never seen a total eclipse before, you're going to be blown out of the water. Uh, might I make a comment about that? Technically, the, well, technically, the difference between a total eclipse and a slow eclipse is literally the difference between night and day. <laughs> There you go. You've got the expert answer. All right, with that, why don't we uh, go ahead and plan to adjourn. If you've got questions, you want to come down here and look at stuff, uh, come and take a peek at some of the things Soren's got. We've got some cake left over. By the way, those of you who had the cake with the blue frosting on the edge, stick your tongue out and see how blue your tongue is. <laughs> yes, please pick up your trash. <laughs>